Uh, I just turned 40 in November, November 13th. So I thought I would try to do no alcohol from January until my 40 wonderful birthday. birthday. Yeah. Okay, so midnight, December 31st on 2016. No, 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 this, our gig wasn't even over at midnight. On well, that's what I'm saying, did you have a drink on I stage? definitely had a drink. Let's go January 2nd. There's a lot of facets to this why I want to do this. And with music, one of the big ones is I don't want alcohol to be a crutch for making improvisational music. Sometimes when you step up to the plate, you might have a mind block or you might be going back to the old vocabulary and, and the brain needs to what I would say a drink to loosen me up a little bit, get outside the box. Right. And I don't want to, you know, for 11 months of my life, I think it'll be okay to experiment and say, I can do this with sound mind and hopefully it'll be better. And then more importantly, I have a child and I don't want to go home to my wife and daughter and have any hangover or effects from, from drinking too much. I want to be present and alert when I'm home as a dad and husband. Right. When you're on the road enough as it is, you don't want the time that you are at home yeah. to be, you know, not at a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And this, but it's not just the drinking. You were saying that, uh, the diet is changing. Everything. Well. You know, my, my wife likes to work out. She likes when I work out and I like to make her happy. And it does, I used to be very fit. I used to do triathlons, uh, a couple guys in the band we used to do them, my wife and I used to do them. And then after we had a, a child, we kind of fell off the fitness, uh, you know, wasn't as, uh, as high on my list. So I'm getting motivated to do that again too. And I feel great. I've been doing it every day or six days a week. Okay. Running's my worst. Running's the worst. I despise running. Okay, see, I, I would have thought it. most people would say the swimming part. Swimming is my best. I enjoy swimming. I try to swim. I've been swimming since I was a little kid. That's actually what I do every Tuesday and Thursday. So, and the eating habits have changed because you want to be healthier and said, what's yeah. the big eating change that you've made? Well, I don't eat fast food, I don't drink pop, and my wife's very healthy, so nothing's in the house it's for me to snack on. Like that. When I lived alone, it was Budweiser, and Oreos, and Klondike's. Oh, and, awesome. and then, you know, I'd hit Chick-fil-A as often as possible. Yeah. So now, um, I'm eating better, I feel better. I'm 40. I'm, yeah, but you're going to get some changes. You're going to get done with this show tonight. You're going to get on the bus. No bus. No, we're, we got a hotel. Well, okay, all right, yeah. bad example, because yeah. we have another night But here typically, now. yes. Yes, yeah, so you get on the bus, or screw it, you'll go to the hotel, yeah. where the options are not going to be kale and quinoa. Well, I don't eat. I mean, I'll, I'll, <laughs> have, like, I'll have a protein bar or edamame or something. Usually, I can, now that I'm not drinking, mm -hmm. I'm not ready to crush pizza or, or fried food, I, I'm disciplined enough to just... Because that is the bad part, is you start drinking, yeah. it's not even really the alcohol, it's the, oh, I'm ready for an entire pot of John's right now. Yeah, and our band, our tour manager, gets five pizzas after every show. When you come back, it's steaming on the tour bus, and you have to put out your will. When you're drunk, there's no willpower. It's like, oh, no, so it's just torture for you is what this is. Yeah, but it's all, you know, it's all discipline and tests. Yeah, yeah. Know, it's great. Are the guys in the band kind of be like, ah, oh, this pizza's so good. Nah, we're, I mean, yeah, we're, we, we jam each other. And <laughs> we're all band of brothers like that. Okay, this card says lottery, and it is, if you won the big one, what would you do and what would you not do? What would change if you won the big Powerball? That's funny that you pulled that one out. I was running this morning yeah. in fitness, and I was watching a documentary called Minimalism. Are you familiar? No. On Netflix. And it's about these two guys just talking about in their life um, what they need, what adds value. So it really made me think about all the things that I do have, I'm fortunate enough to have, what, what adds value. So in all honesty, and not sounding cheesy, I would do some charitable work. I would give back to my family and those that have helped me get to where I am. I'd probably help the band. But charity would be up there at the, at the point. Growing up, I did a lot of volunteer work with my mom, did a lot of time at Soup Kitchen and Death Touch family. And I think getting back into that and giving to the people who really need it would do that. But one of the quotes was, this is why lottery winners are always miserable, because they don't know how to deal with that kind of Right, catch. So I think getting is the best reward because you end up feeling so good when you do it. I mean, I'm sure there would be some sort of indulgent purchase. For sure. Like, what, For would sure. Be, like, what would be your first indulgent purchase? Uh, I would probably, <laughs> I would probably, I mean, how much are we talking here? I'd probably get like a house, a small little ski shack in Aspen. I think that when you ask a musician this type of question about the lottery, 
their, their answer is never, oh, I would stop doing this because oh, no. who doesn't want to play music, you know? If you're talking to us, yeah, if you're an accountant or something, you know, hell yeah, I'm putting away the books and I'm done. Yeah. I'm going to work again. But if I could have my own bus and bring my wife and child out and have a homeschool, that'd be interesting. That'd be yeah. cool for a while. Yeah, because then I'd be able to travel as much as possible. Right. That'd be, that'd be really, really special. Until so the kid's like, you know what would be awesome, Dad? <laughs> uh, friends. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how much luck has really played. I mean, I'm lucky to be healthy, I'm lucky to have a healthy family, and I'm lucky to, uh, to be able to yeah. I'm gonna play music with my best friends and, and do it for a living and wake up happy every day. I think that's that luck, but that all takes hard work and discipline. Well, I don't, I'm not to butcher the quote, but it's something to the effect of, you know, success is when hard work and luck collide. Sure, sure plays yeah. a big part in it. Was there a moment, though, for maybe for the band where there was a night or uh, a chance encounter where it's like, wow, this changed everything? I don't know. I, I, think, I feel we were pretty lucky to be invited to the first water room. I think that was a pivotal moment in our sure. career, you know. Um, it's been going on for 13 years now. I think the first one was two thousand one or two thousand two. Maybe I don't know. I, my my time frame is I was living in Denver in two thousand one, two thousand two, and I remember them passing yeah. it. I think that was that was a big step for us. We yeah. started as a band in, in ninety eight, and I just uh, I mean we didn't even really leave our greater Michigan area yeah. until two thousand. So that that was a big moment for us. But South Bend, I mean, you know, it's always lightning in a bottle. You guys happen to be in the right spot, the right school, the right this to yeah. meet each other. All of, I guess all of that works out for you. It's like when you go, when, we, when I was in Notre Dame and um, failed out of my pre-med classes and ended up choosing Japanese and marketing, you know, maybe maybe the luck was, maybe luck had something to do with that, me meeting Brendan Bayless and us starting a band together. You were studying Japanese? I was studying pre-med. I had all the oh, time before that I was going to be a neurosurgeon or an orthodontist. Obvious, that's right. Yeah, obvious. That's what I was going to do. And then when I didn't go to class, um, it was pretty hard to pass those classes. So I did quite poorly my first semester. And then I had to make a decision. You know, they're like, what are you going to major in? And I um, grew up with the close friends of the family that were Japanese. Uh, my grandfather was in World War II, Japanese Americans, and, and I was uh, enamored by the culture. Right. language, so I said, I'm going to learn the language, and I'm also going to get a business degree, just in case. So then I thought, oh, I'm going to work in Japan and do something with the music business and live in Japan. I thought that was going to be cool. Then I met Bayless, and I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to make music with you. And now, how many years later? It's... How lucky am I now? Right. Okay, well, hold on. I, this is not to follow up on this. Neurosurgeon or an orthodontist. <laughs> Neurosurgery, I get, because it's cool, it's brain stuff, it's yeah. sort of interesting. To be an orthodontist, that just sounds like, I don't understand why anybody would want to become an orthodontist. I'll tell you why, my orthodontist in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is yeah. cool, and he had the whole place, just it, it ran itself, and he did all the fun things in life. And I also always thought it was very important, smiles are contagious, to have a nice smile, to have nice teeth. I always have floss in my pocket, I got it over the ping pong table right there. Got to take care of your teeth, yeah. yeah, very important. So I thought that I had it figured out, and I was gonna move back to Kalamazoo, become an orthodontist, take over his you know, you know, this is like, you know, just yeah. you know, dreams. I thought that might, that has to be my reality. You know, you're 18, you don't know what you're going to do. Yeah, I don't know, but it's, I just see teeth, like, yes, okay, I'll take care of my own teeth. Yeah. Other people's teeth, I want nothing to do with them. <laughs> and I hear people who like pop zits, and they're like, I'll be a dermatologist. And they're like, whoa, wait, I have to look at I have met those people that are like, oh, yeah. can I pop that zit? Yeah. Are you insane? My wife, I think a lot of the Oh, she loves picking black and zits. I thought all girls kind of like that in a weird way. And at this point, I didn't even play bass. Yeah. You know, I met Brendan. You're a guitarist. I was kind of a guitarist, kind of a piano player. And, and I gave uh, Brendan my Les Paul and my little PDM. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I'm going to go buy a bass. Let's do this. Let's make original music together. So what did you buy? I bought an Ibanez. And a, I, had a, I did have a bass amp from our high school band that, uh, that just took a dump last week. Oh, really? After 25 years, 22 years. Yeah. Rest in so peace. Now I'm getting it fixed and I'm donating it to. Uh, my daughter's school, oh, cool. they send uh, musical instruments over to Africa, the musical oh, teachers, awesome. so they're going to put it on a cargo ship and send it over. So. I feel like there was an era where everybody's first bass was an Ibanez. Right? Cool. Yeah. Oh, it was affordable. Yeah, it was affordable. <laughs> but we were talking actually a little bit earlier about, uh, you have to tell me the name of that, you know, the bass that you used that you used. Sire by Marcus Miller. Sire. Sire by Marcus yeah. Miller. And, and what was the, uh, the thought process behind that? Well, I, I had heard about it and I went online and, and watched reviews and then I heard what Marcus Miller's 
point was. He said, if I'm going to put my name on it, I want it to be a quality instrument. But a lot of young kids are struggling um, to even have music in schools, let alone be able to afford a great sounding bass at a cost that their parents can afford, you know? $3,000 is a lot of money to spend on a, on a great bass. The parents are mortgaging their cars and their houses for these kids to have bass. And he's like, why can't I make one from the 300 to 500 range that's going to sound awesome that these kids can have? And I push click, and I have it, and I love it. I play up and that's your main stage bass. I mean, I play F bass, the F bass right. I can, which is the main bass too. But right now, I'm, I'm really, you know, giving this one some love. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you paid, that, you said what, like 500 bucks? 500 bucks yeah. for this thing. Incredible. And it's an incredible 18 volt preamp inside, it's just, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's more, if anybody can afford it and they're saying, I need a bass, I need a new bass, you can get a four string for two ninety nine. dollars that's, that's a no brainer. Well, I can tell you uh, very candidly, um, I left Pittsburgh in 1988 when Appetite Destruction was coming out. That's when I moved to Collins, Michigan. Right. And the first friend I met gave me a Dragonlance book and then Appetite Destruction. Listen to this, read this. I was like, okay, you're cool, you're my friend. <laughs> Guns and Roses was, but the smell part is that we would drive back from Pittsburgh to uh, Kalamazoo all the time, and, and we did have window lock. And that's when Dad was pretty, it's pretty rancid. Really, it's pretty rancid. Serious, serious doom farts and locked the windows, and he almost said, "I hate you, please, we're gonna die." You know, so farts is my first one with smell. Second, I play hockey. Um, all through, uh, and you never get rid of that smell. I know ever, that smell. Ever. So that one always comes back. Um, you know, not to cheese it up though, my my wife's perfume, my oh. wife's scarf, something you know, like that. that That's nice. nice. It's not cheese. I love it. Nice. I love her to death. What are you doing on purpose? Was he like, oh yeah. Oh, you, you get the chuckle, and would be silent, and get the chuckle, and, like, and then all of a sudden, we'll go, Dad, Dad, oh my God, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? But I mean, I'll be straight. I mean, I'm, I'm no shame in this. Like, farting in my family is, is it's out in the open for everyone. It's not one of those, oh, I go to politely leave the room. It's, not right. it's, it's loud, it's there, or it's silent, and you get a laugh. Like, it's always, just like just like in the locker, locker room with your friends, or on a tour bus with these guys. Yeah. You know, you know what? Yeah. They're a lot funny. of farts. Farts are funny. Farts will never Farts be funny. are funny. And if you don't think farts are funny, I don't want to be a friend. That's right, you heard it here. Yeah. Farts are funny. Does your daughter think farts are funny? She does. She does. I think she uh, this is pretty funny. She she got out of uh, one, she, uh, we were in Dominican holidays and the girl that was watching her while I was playing, uh, she let out a big toot and she goes, oh, I have to tell my dad about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Which I find adorable. And if you don't think farts are funny, I don't want to be a friend.